This is the ultimate FX6 documentary setup. At least I like to think so. About 50% of my work is documentary style and some of it long form where you've got to hold the camera for a long period of time. There's a reason shooting on the shoulder is one of the most ubiquitous uh, traditional ways of shooting documentary. Um, it's got an immediacy to it, you're on the same eye line as most of your subjects um, and it's very easy to respond quickly when the camera's up there. However, due to its small size, it's not really perfect for up on the shoulder. You can shoot from the hip easily out of the box, but you don't want to always be looking up people's noses. So I've been fine tuning how my FX6 is set up um, and I'm going to share it here and hopefully that'll help someone else putting together a similar setup. I'll start with the viewfinder. A lot of operators do like to run a larger screen on the camera on the top handle so they can really see what they're doing. That's perfectly understandable. Um, you're filming in 4K, you really want to hit critical focus and really want to see what you're doing. But for me, with documentary work, a screen on top is another thing to power. Um, it's a lot of extra mass on the top. Um, and if you're in a hurry and running around, that can get in the way. For me, I like to use the viewfinder or screen that comes with the camera. Uh, it works with the expanded focus. It's compact. It runs off the camera power. I do also like to pair it with the FX9 loop. This really gets the image large in your eye. Um, and I really like working with a loop. Um, when you brace it against your head like that, you've got an extra point of contact with the camera, uh, which helps you be steadier. The one downside of the FX6 is it's not designed for a loop like this. So it'll droop, it doesn't support the weight. A lot of companies do make uh, brackets now that will replace the one that comes with the camera. And I went with the one from Vocus. Um, it's a friction mount. So uh, once you've clipped the LCD screen in there, you can rotate it, let go and it'll stay there. And the other thing I have found is, although you can flip this up, documentary making where you're running around, that's gonna break. You can really see there's a, only a small plastic hinge there. So I always advise slide it off, pop that in a pocket or in a backpack if you need to take it off. But I do find it handy to have the loop because on a summer's day where you're shooting into the sunset and you really can't see what you're doing, it really helps to just isolate your eye from the surrounding world and focus on what you're doing. Next up, it's not very exciting to talk about, but the base plate. You often need a base plate for a camera because you can attach 15mm bars and that gives you places to uh, attach all sorts of accessories and handles and things you might need. However, I didn't want a big bulky base plate that got in the way. Um, the FX6 is a compact camera and I didn't want to ruin that too much by making it big and bulky. I also don't like VCT style plates that you see on a lot of broadcast style cameras. But for me, VCT plates are often a little wobbly um, and they also mean you have to have quite a large footprint on the base of the, pl uh, of the camera itself. So for me, I much prefer the dovetail style systems that you see on cinema cameras where you can slide the camera back and forward um, to adjust the weight balance. This is great if you suddenly throw a longer lens on, you can just slide the camera back and now you're balanced on the tripod. I settled on the base plate system from Tilter. I think it's one of the best out there for the FX6. It's small, compact, lightweight, yet it's also got things like area rosettes on the side and it comes with a top plate and side plate for the camera as well. It gives you lots of extra mounting points. Um, these have um, area locating pins as well, so when you screw things in that are compatible with that, they won't twist. No one wants to miss a shot because they're adjusting something that's slipped on the camera. Most of the time, if you're doing a very short amount of on-the-shoulder work, you might find that a shoulder pad isn't necessary. Um, when using the camera stripped down, you can butt the FX6 up against your, your shoulder and work like that fine. But if you're doing shoulder work for a long period of time, like motorsport coverage, where you might be going up and down the pit lane for hours on end, you really want a shoulder pad just to support the camera and not hurt yourself. A lot of the shoulder pads I found out there um, attach via the 15mm bars and can get in the way because you can't really take them off easily. Um, and in the end, I settled on uh, something very simple. It's a, a piece of high density foam molded into a shoulder pad. It's got holes cut into it for 15 mil bars, so you can slide it on. But there are slots at the top, so you can really quickly pull this off if you need to in a hurry. If I need to get a tripod shot very quickly, I can easily pop this off, even if I've got things on the back of the bars as well. You can see I've also modified mine a little bit. Uh, I just cut away a small wedge here, so it'll interface with the uh, profile of the camera and base plate just a little bit better, gets the pad a little bit further under the camera, just helps with weight balance. Once the camera's supported on this, you can shoot all day long. Lenses. This can be a real subjective matter in the world of filmmaking. It really depends on the type of subject you're filming, the uh, shooting style you want to go for, or just your own personal preferences. Uh, but I'm going to go through the lenses I pick for documentary making um, and my thoughts behind those. 
Zoom lenses to me are essential for documentary making. You never quite know what's going to happen. You might not always be in the right spot. There might not be time to reposition yourself to get the moment that might not happen again. So for me, being able to zoom to reframe at a moment's notice is vital. For my primary lens, really I want an all round zoom that gives me as wide as I need to go and gets me as close in as I need to go. As sensor sizes have got bigger in cameras, the zoom ratios available for zoom lenses has actually kind of gone down. You start to need very, very big lenses if you've got very big sensors. I find on full frame, I've settled on 24 to 105 as being about the perfect documentary mid zoom range. I see a lot of people working with 24 to 70 mil and I, those lenses are great. They're f2.8, so you get that extra stop. The depth of field is a tiny bit shallower. But I find personally 70 mil is a little bit limiting for a close up. You've always got to be, um, you know, getting closer to your subject. And there are times when you just can't do that. I ended up settling on the Sigma 24 to 105. The reason for that, the EF mount version has image stabilization, um, and that's fantastic for documentary work. The 24 to 105 range of lenses are generally f4, um, but I find that's not really a problem these days. Cameras like the FX6 are very sensitive in low light. F4 is just enough for a bit of de shallow depth of field without being extreme. One of the things I don't like about Sigma's 24 to 105 is the um, the thin focus ring. It's also behind the zoom ring instead of in front like most other lenses. So it can make it a little tricky to find. To help me out on that front, I've added this uh, seamless focus gear ring. I wouldn't really use this with a, a follow focus system. It's not really that kind of lens. It doesn't have hard stops. But having this gearing on really helps your fingers find where the focus ring is. And it's something I'd really recommend. So why did I go for a photography style lens? I much prefer cine style lenses with their smooth focus rings. It's much, much easier to use. But for me, there's a couple of reasons. There really isn't a 24 to 105 mil kind of range in cinema lenses for full frame. The other thing you can get with photography lenses is you can get image stabilization um, and you can also make use of the clever autofocus face tracking sort of technology, which is really, really useful for modern documentary making. It's not something I rely on, but it's a great extra tool to use to help you out. I found that Sigma's EF mount lenses work really well with Sony's autofocus technology, as long as you use the MC11 adapter. Canon EF lenses don't work well with Sony's autofocus systems at all. I'm a fan of Sigma lenses. They tend to be sharp, neutral, clean. And that brings me to my second lens I bring on documentary shoots, a long lens, the Sigma 70 to 200 mm f2.8 Sport. The reason I went for EF mount lenses uh, was really so I could also use them with any other camera system. The other reason is with the 70 to 200, you can use teleconverters. If I bought the E mount version, I wouldn't be able to do that. It means I can just add a little bit of extra reach onto my lens without really taking much extra equipment with me. Wireless video. A lot of the documentaries I work on have a director or producer on board, uh, and they really need to be able to see what's being filmed. So I always like to have a wireless video transmitter mounted to the camera, and then I give a wireless monitor to the director or producer. The system I'm using is by Hollyland. It's the Mars 400S Pro, and there are alternatives, but I found this system to be very reliable. Mounting the transmitter to the camera was a bit of a challenge. I like things to be really, really secure on a documentary style camera. And I didn't want to use an articulating arm like a Noga arm because those can get knocked easily. I decided to mount the transmitter at the back right of the camera because I really didn't want it on the top handle, which would get in the way if I wanted to do handheld. Um, and I didn't want it at the back because sometimes you might want to brace the camera against your body in, in, a, in a certain way. And if this is at the back, you're going to knock this and knock the aerials. So I found the back right side of the camera, perfect place, out of the way, never gets knocked. And to attach it, I settled on using these little 15 mil rod clamps. Uh, one, there's one quarter inch there that screws in and then one onto the side of the camera and then a small little bit of bar attaching the two. Once clamped, it doesn't go anywhere, but you can also swing it out of the way if you need access to the ports that's right near. The other advantage of having this right at the back right is it's right next to the battery for power and it's right next to the ports for video. So it means you can have very, very short cable runs, which is ideal. Now let's talk about power. Now, if I'm doing documentary shots for just a few hours or a little bit of B-roll here and there in between going on tripod, I see no need to run the camera on v -locks. In those scenarios, I will just run standard BPU batteries. Um, I'm a big fan of these ones from Hawkwoods. Uh, they've got little D-tap ports on the back as well. So I can run my uh, wireless video system and camera from this one battery. 
But for days where I'm filming for longer and I want a lot more battery life and I might be having more accessories on the camera, then I did want to have a V-Lock power system so I can use V-Lock batteries. There are many V-Lock battery plates out there for the FX6. Some attached to 15mm bars, which means you can also get a BPU battery into the camera as well. And this means you can hot swap the V-Lock batteries. That's a great solution. For me, I ended up not going down that route. I wanted something that would attach firmly to the camera and wouldn't come loose. I wanted the V-Lock bracket to become part of the camera. So in the end, I went with this one from Tilta. It fits into the battery recess. It then also attaches onto the top plate. It's got two D-taps, one either side. It's also got a two pin Limo power out and it's also got a five volt USB out as well. So this is perfect for powering all kinds of accessories. For me, I power the wireless video transmitter through this, through the DTAP. One thing that's essential for doing on the shoulder work really is an arm extension. So you can have the camera's handle out the front. When I had an FS7, I used to have a, an extension arm for that made by the company Shape, but I found that puts quite a bit of distance sideways between the camera and you. And with the, with the handle out like that, I found it puts a lot of torque on on the side there and you've got to twist the camera constantly to to get it back level and that puts a lot of strain I, I found i had quite a few pain issues operating a camera like that so when looking for an extension arm for the fx6 i wanted one that had the minimal amount of sideways offset and i settled on this one by focus this has a quick release for um, adjusting the length of the of where the handle is um, and the other end attaches via um, ari rosette which has pros and cons it doesn't quick release but i find once you've attached this you don't really need to adjust it very often. Focus supply a little attachment that goes on the side of the camera where the handle normally sits that turns that into an Ari rosette um, so you can attach the handle. I don't like this. Um, the reason is once you're attached like that, you can only have the handle on the end of the extension arm. You can't take the handle off and put that on the side of the camera. For me, I want a versatile setup for documentary work. Uh, you never know where you might have to go. You, you never know quite what you'll need to do to get a shot. So I wanted the flexibility of having the camera on the arm and then being able to take it off and put it on the body if I need to suddenly get in a car or, or go somewhere that's a tight, awkward space. That's one of the reasons I went for the Tilda base plate. It's got Ari rosettes built into the plate itself, which means I could remove the one Vocus supplied now I can attach the focus extension arm onto the tilter base plate for shooting on the shoulder. And then if I want to go handheld and have it by the hip, I can just quickly take the handle off, relocate it to the camera body and I'm ready to go. And it's really, really quick to go from one to the other. We also tend to run a second handle on the left hand side of the camera. Most of the time my hand is on the lens like a traditional documentary maker. I want to have my hand on the focus ring or I want to be able to adjust the focal length but sometimes you need to hold a shot for a long period of time and that's when I can reach down, hold onto that second handle and it just gives you that extra bit of support that makes the shots that extra bit steadier. Sound really is half the picture. I was taught when learning to use a camera, never ever run a mute camera. So I always have a top mic running. On a lot of documentary shoots, I'm with a Soundy, so really sound is their responsibility, but I still always like to have something like a wireless hop to the camera so I can have a, a mix of what they're recording recorded next to the footage. This can really help editors out just to have a, a little backup copy of the audio recorded on the camera. If I'm on a minimal crew documentary and there's no Soundy there and sound becomes my responsibility, I tend to want to radio mic the presenter or the main contributor, or I might even run two radio mics if there's more than one contributor talking together. For my main radio mic, I use a Sony radio mic system. What's great about the Sony systems is they can take power from the smart shoe on top of the camera. This is a great feature for documentary making because it's one extra thing you don't have to worry about batteries for. You can route the audio through the smart shoe as well on the FX6 and run the audios to channels three and four. But I find in my testing, this comes out a little bit noisier than just using a cable to the XLR port. So that's my recommendation. I don't know why that is, but it's what I found. So there we go, my ultimate FX6 documentary setup. For me, this setup has worked really well over the last year or two. Seeing through the camera and can concentrate on the story, on the shots, rather than thinking about the kit. So, have you got an FX6? How do you set it up for documentary work? I'm always interested in how people do things differently and different approaches, so let me know in the comments below.